Welcome to the Salt Strong Podcast, disrupting fishing entertainment as you know it. Prepare to laugh. Prepare to get to know fishing legends in a whole new and unfiltered way. And on occasion, you might even learn a thing or two about fishing. Here's your host, Joe Simons, like diamonds. Hobby, lobby, and God. Hey, everybody, Joe Simons, like diamonds, Salt Strong and Church. We are back. I love reading books in this book I just finished called Leadership Not by the Book by David Green, who is the founder and CEO of Hobby Lobby. Wow. I, I've talked about this before where a book shows up in my life or a message right at the right time, right when I needed to hear it. It just it, it God's perfect timing. And this one was it. One of my friends had just texted me out of the blue, someone I hadn't talked to in a long time. Thank you, Chris, by the way, if you're listening to this. And he said, hey, man, you've got to read this book. It, it, it reminded me of, of kind of what you're doing at Salt Strong and some things you probably need to hear. And uh, so I bought it and then I sat on it because I, I have a big list of other books I'm reading. And I finally got to it. And I couldn't put it down. I uh, read this sucker essentially in, in a weekend. Uh, I started it on like a Thursday evening and then read a little bit Friday morning. And then the weekend just went all in and, um, and put hours into this book. It is a flat out amazing. Uh, if you don't know Hobby Lobby, you know, it's basically a, a, an arts and crafts type of a, of a store. And that's really what they're, they're known for. It, they're massive, but also simplistic. If you look at them, like every single one follows the same pattern. If you go to one, you know, in um, Orlando, Florida, and you go to one in Arkansas or Oklahoma or wherever, they all look and feel the exact same and have the exact same inventory for the most part, uh, it, it, you know, with the, maybe the exception of some seasonal stuff. Uh, but I mean, really fascinating how they've done it and how they've scaled it and they're opening uh, essentially a new Hobby Lobby like every week. I mean, their goal is like 50 a year. Uh, that's, I mean, you think that's crazy, right? And he says, yeah, once we have the, you know, the building up essentially and like the floor down, uh, it's two weeks, it's done. That's crazy. So uh, for me, in terms of being a, a CEO and and growing a company, this, the word simplicity rang throughout this book. But I want to talk about the, the God piece of it. And, uh, you know, I think the word giving is one that is is probably the the one word if you're just going to uh, uh, put a word on the success of Hobby Lobby, just the fact that they give. And obviously the Bible talks about that constantly. Even this morning, you know, I read my little daily Bible every day. And uh, the the psalm at the end was talking about the, essentially, I, I'm going to misquote this, but it was, it literally said the word stingy, like, you know, the stingy who are trying to hold on and everything will end up with nothing uh, very quickly and don't, and don't see it coming. That, that was really the theme. And uh, it was right after I'd finished this book. I was like, wow, God is trying to tell me to be more giving and more loving. And what they did, I mean, they're giving away just, you know, 50% of their profits, 50. That means everything left over, the stuff that that's really how they get paid, right? I mean, even Luke and I get a, a salary, like, you know, 20 something thousand, but it's nothing. You know, the only way we really get paid is if there's any money left over, any profits. And their profits, they're giving away. 50% and they want to go higher 50% of it. It just literally flat out giving it away to ministries, to, to churches, to anything that they feel God calling uh, them to do. But it didn't always start out that way. And, and, and like most of us, we have to go through trials and tribulations and try to figure things out and just a really fascinating story. So it all started, um, back in 1979 where they only had a couple stores and they were barely getting by, you know, he, he and his, his wife were, you know, the, the sole owners and, um, they were, they didn't even, they didn't even have the amount of money I'm about to tell you and profits to even give away. And he heard a message like from God, he's like, Lord was speaking to me and it kept happening over and over again. And it says, you need to give $30,000 for this very specific, uh, Bible literature, uh, uh, uh initiative. That, uh, that someone had asked him about and he he kind of said no and it just wasn't a fit he didn't have the money to give to it and god just kept putting him back on his heart he's like you need to give he was thinking maybe i'll give a thousand right he's like you need to give thirty thousand dollars for this bible literature and he said this is one of the pivotal points in his life and so he's like i don't even have like we don't even make thirty thousand dollars right this is back when he was keeping 100 percent of his profits just to stay alive and pay the bills a lot of us who've started businesses know how that feels and so imagine that, right? Imagine your entire profits for the year. 
worth 30,000. Let's just keep it simple. And God's telling you to give away a hundred percent of it before you even make it. <clears throat> so talk to his wife, he prayed on it and it, it, it just kept being this reoccurring dream and theme. And he's like, all right, I've, we've just got to do it. But he said, we, the wife said, we don't even have this money to give away. And she's like, well, let's come up with a, an idea. And they thought about it and it hit him. It's like, Hey, let's, let's give 7,500 four times. We'll do it all right now. And we'll, we'll postmark the checks. So we'll do, we want, you know, today that they can cash in. And then, uh, basically every other month, uh, you know, we'll, we'll post date the date. So if today's, you know, de- December 10th, uh, we'll postmark one today. The next one will be, you know, February 10th and then April, just so that they, these things will actually cash and not bounce. And we'll send all of them now. So we can't go back on this and we'll be transparent and, you know, tell this charity, here's what we're doing. Hey, we don't have this money, but God's told us to do this and we're going to postmark it. So they did that. They, uh, they, they sent all of these, uh, these checks, of uh, $30,000 total. And you know, the great news is they did not bounce. They, uh, they made it uh, just barely. But what happened shortly after that was one of those just like monumental things you hear about. It's not why they did it. He did it just because he kept feeling God calling him to do this. But all of a sudden, all these doors started opening. Their, their couple stores they had became more profitable than ever. Uh, it was just like floods of people just started showing up and coming in. He, he's like, it was almost unexplainable. And that was one of those just kind of pivotal moments looking back at the overall growth of Hobby Lobby through the years where that moment right there, you can see it just almost starts going uh, straight up. Uh, now they did have a couple, you know, ups and downs like we all do. That, you know, f- you know, obviously this is a long time ago. This late seventies. There's been a couple of different, uh, you know, little recessions and and dips, and uh, and and they felt some of those. Some of them they, they didn't feel, but kind of the next big pivotal thing in the history and timeline of Hobby Lobby was he had uh, this is David the CEO had another one of those just conversations with God and. The, he said, I, I sensed the Lord asking me what what would happen if if uh, if the Jones family owned this and gave it to God and you were just the CEO. So um, what I'm saying here with this is, you know, God's telling him, all right, you know, you're you're so concerned about ownership. And, and at this point, you know, it was a success, successful company. Um, you know, making millions of dollars and like, all right, what, what do we do? This, you know, our kids going to take this over? And you, know, you start thinking, I, I think about that personally. And, and I've struggled reading this because, you know, I'm, I, I'm thinking about that. All right. We know it, it's also going to be this profitable, this profitable. What, what are we going to do with these profits? And, you know, how does this impact my family and Luke's family and all the families that work for us? And, uh, you know, you, you can, you can end up getting really wrapped up into it. Uh, right. I mean, it, 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 it's one of the negatives about money and success. I mean, it, and not to say it was like an ego trip, but you can, it can start taking up a big portion of your mind and your thinking. And so God basically said, all right, you know, what if, what if you guys who currently own it just gave it up to me and you were just the CEO that you were essentially a steward of Hobby Lobby. And David kind of thought about it and prayed on it. He's like, well, man, that, that, that would kind of simplify things, right? I'm, I'm now just paid CEO and uh, I don't really have to, to, to worry about that. And, uh, and, and at that point, that was when he really declared to everyone, he's like, all right, guys, God owns Hobby Lobby. And, and they've gone a step further now and have literally declared that, like their kids are getting nothing, by the way. Like Hobby Lobby is, is, is gonna, now they're giving away 50% of profits. At some point when he passes away, the succession plan is essentially... Uh, to not have this go to the kids, that this is just going to be something that's going to be kingdom growing and will continue to have profits just going to help other charities and to and, and, uh, and to grow Christian foundations, et cetera. Really fascinating. But that was a point where he says, all right, guy, guys, God owns Hobby Lobby. And if God owns Hobby Lobby, then how do we operate differently than those who believe they own their own businesses. And, and it brings up a question, you know, does God own everything? You know, does God really own everything? And we've talked about that in the past podcast. It's, it's one of those really big, deep questions, because if we agree he doesn't, then are we saying God didn't make all this stuff? But if we agree he does, 
right? And we have our faith in God and say, yeah, God does own anything. He could take any of this stuff away from us at any time. He could take us away from this earth at any any time. And so if he does own everything, then why don't we act like that in real life? Why do we get so, so concerned about things that go bad or broken or stolen, right? Or get taken away from us or get wrapped up in a national disaster, right? Why, why do we get so just enthralled and, 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 and sometimes takes up a huge chunk of our time about, you know, gifts, what are we getting and who's getting us this and what do we own and what do we have versus our neighbors? And, you know, why don't I have a new car when my neighbors do, or my friend does, or my coworker? I mean, it's easy to get wrapped up at this. I mean, yours truly, uh, it, it's one of the things I personally struggle with a, a lot. Uh, and, and I, I think that that's why this book was just really, really good timing. Uh, cause it was a good reminder, you know, God, I do believe God does own everything. And we did that with salt Strong. That's why we came up with unchurch. And that was the very first episode because people started saying, why are you doing this? And I was like, honestly, I believe God owns this company and he's called me to do this and I'm going to be a steward and I'm going to listen to him. And it's same deal. If you look at the trajectory of salt strong and how we've grown ever since we came up with that unchurch. It is. It has just been an, an upward trend, if you will. E even through COVID and everything else, there hasn't really been any dips. It's just kind of continued to keep growing, and uh, and that was the same point where we, Luke and I, and and really as a team, as a company, we said, you know what, God does own everything, including Salt Strong, and uh, and and we want to be good stewards. And so it it brings up this stewardship versus ownership, and this is not just for a business. This is with your household. This is with your personal house. If you have a second home and first car, second car, all the stuff that we have, it's stewardship versus ownership. This is critical to understand, right? Because now we can start making better decisions saying, all right, if God does own this, your house, whatever it is, is this really what I feel like he's calling me to do with this? Or is this just something that I want to do? And, you know, he, he brings up this point. He's like, I've seen so many of my, you know, friends. He's like, they're not close friends. They're just people that I've, you know, when you're a, a, essentially a, a billionaire, uh, even though he's giving most of everything away, you know, you're in the same kind of ranks of, of other billionaires and you get to go to certain parties and meet these people. And he's like, I'll be honest. And he didn't name names, but in this book, he's like, the majority of the billionaires, these founders of these companies, the vast majority, Oh, to, to the point he said almost all of them are somewhat miserable and they're only like if you hear their conversations it's about this new jet they bought or this new yacht or this new island and and all that stuff sounds so cool to us it sounds cool to me i'll be honest with you uh it, it is it's something probably a lot of us look at that and say man i wish that was me i'd like to have an island i'd like to have an island i won't lie to you but he's like all of those people deep down he's like almost all of them are either cheating on their spouse they're divorced they're not happy they don't have great marriages they don't have relationships with their kids and he's like to me i would rather have a great marriage and a relationship with my kids than a billion dollars he's like it's literally worth that much to me i'd i'd rather know that here on this earth, I had that relationship and I'd rather know that I'm going to get celebrated when I go up to heaven, knowing that I did the right thing and I put God first and I let God run all the stuff that he owns and I became a good steward and just didn't feel like this owner and that I had to have all of this stuff. He's like, I got a great home. He's like, honestly, the home I have is big and it causes me enough problems as it is. I don't need two or three or five of them. I certainly don't need a new island. I can only imagine the plumbing issues that happen on an island. And uh, he's being a little facetious, but that that was that's kind of his attitude throughout this book is he's like the majority of these billionaires that he meets. I mean, the public ones that we know, right, and just in the last 24 months, I mean, Bill Gates, right, multi-billionaire who's, who's been uh, divorced, um, uh, Bezos, you know, d divorced, uh, you know, even some of the, the highest paid athletes of all time, all divorced. I mean, Tiger Woods, I mean, all these people can get caught cheating on their spouses. I mean... It, it, it's it's sad and he's like if you go to these gala events with all these billionaires he's like that is the that that's that's the real life is most of these people are empty they're just they don't have god in their life they're searching for the next adrenaline hit which is to buy this new helicopter or plane or island or second home or super yacht or whatever it is and he's like 
I just, I decided right then and there, the first t- time I went to this stuff, I didn't want to be like that. It's just like, I want to do the opposite. I want to put God first. I'm going to have God in charge of the of the company and I'm just going to be a steward. I'm going to listen. And, and every time they've had recessions or even COVID, right? For them, COVID was a real deal, right? I mean, Hobby Lobby, you know, made the news on that because, you know, they were trying to keep a lot of their stores open. They were like, God, we don't want to fire employees. Uh, we're not going to make them come in, but for employees that, that uh, have either had it or uh, are fine coming in, we're going to keep some of these stores open and keep them going. But I mean, the majority of their stores were forced to be shut down. It was a big deal. And, uh, and so every time they would have obstacles like that, guess what he would do? He would pray and he would listen and he would pray and he would listen. And he's like, all right, God, this is yours. I'm just your steward. I'm the, I'm the person here on earth that you need to, to make the calls. Tell me what to do. And then he would get the answers. It was fascinating. It was just time and time again. He, he shared all the different downturns over the over the years. And uh, it, it was really, really wild. The other big one was, you know, if we're going to say God owns this, regardless of what it is, he better have a vote. Right. And and sometimes that, that will be a, a vivid message or, or a dream from God. Sometimes that'll just be putting yourself there and and say what would how would god vote on this one do i really need an island right is this is this something god's calling me to do is this something that i just really want to do or that i feel like i need to to increase my stature to feel better about myself temporarily right because all of those things these material things they do bring a a burst of happiness right Uh, i'll be honest when i got a new car when i bought this house it was a burst of happiness but that's not lasting. It's not fulfilling. And then it's on to the next one, right? All of a sudden the car gets old or the house gets old. I'm like, oh man, I, I want a new house. I want a new car. Uh, this this thing is old and it's banged up. It's got dents, We've got a bad roof, uh, right? I mean, it, we can all kind of laugh at this because that, that, that's how we are. And I, I, I've i never, I've never met David Green, but I've, I've never even read about anyone who who really lives this in and out the way he he has, at least over the last couple of decades, because, you know, he was not perfect in the earlier years. But man, the last couple of decades, the, the dude gives God the vote, meaning, you know, they will literally have like if they're around a boardroom, they'll have an empty seat. And he's like, that's God's seat. What would he do? What what would he want us to do right now? And they literally have that vote count more than any other ones. I mean, that's that's going the next next level, but kind of hard to argue with the success. I mean, Hobby Lobby continues to keep getting blessed. And the reason it's called Leadership Not by the Book is they've had Harvard Business, you know, Harvard Business Review does uh, pretty in-depth studies on companies. And they went into Hobby Lobby just like they do with Coca-Cola and Amazon and all the big names over the years, Home Depot. They, they do these Harvard Business Reviews where, you know, Harvard will go in there and study these companies and find out what they can learn and what are the similarities and their first response when coming in to Hobby Lobby and the headquarters and and looking at everything and seeing how it all works, they actually said, this doesn't make sense. And they said, furthermore, this should not work. (laughs) It, It follows nothing that Harvard's ever reported on before. It's, it's nothing like, anything that's ever been done and yet it's a multi 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 billion dollar company in that wild and and they're like how how does this work like they were they were literally confused when they went in and looked at the operations and the business model and how they do things right how they even vote on things like this just doesn't make any sense how does this <clears throat> how does this work and he's like it's god we, as soon as we gave this over to god he has a different game plan than most mortals do, and uh, and we're just following it, you know, and uh, and that's why it looks different because no other billion dollar company that he knows of has truly given the company and the operations and everything in the final vote over to God. Really, really fascinating. And so that means you know God must must lead, yeah, and, and that means that every big decision needs to you know be preyed upon. And, uh, and, and once again, this is not business. I, I hope you can relate this to your personal life, right? Or, or the big decisions you're making uh, with your family on everything from your job to potentially moving or um, how you interact with kids and what you do with your kids. If you're giving to your kids, um, uh, really, really wild. And I mean, he's he's really big on not giving stuff to the kids. He's like, I've just seen it over and over again. He's like, in fact, I've I've yet to see it really work out well where someone gives a kid 
a hundred million dollars or, or even just any a large amount of money that it's really worked out well for them in the long run, that they really felt fulfilled, that they really learned hard work. It's almost impossible um, is, is this point. And he's like, I, I don't want to take the chance. Yeah, may, maybe there's one in a million that, that it will work and they're just they're just wired differently. Uh, but he's like, it's really tough. He's like, even for me, I, I you never would have known my name if I had had a dad that gave me even a million dollars or two million or five million or a hundred. He's like, I, if if I had had that, I never would have pushed this hard. I never would have built all of this. I never would have even have been in the position to trust God because I would have thought I wouldn't need it to. I already have this parachute. It's really, really fascinating. So I think the you know the, the lessons learned are put God first in, in your life, in your business, in your work, whatever you're doing, your family, uh, trust them. And that was another big one is, you know, they had to put some massive trust. I mean, you have to have some legit faith to, you know, put a company like that with now thousands of employees in, in just God's hands, right? To say, God, we're going to trust you. We're going to give you the final vote. I mean, that that's a massive, massive amount of, uh, of faith. And, uh, and this whole stewardship versus ownership, I think that's one of the most powerful ones. And it takes off so much pressure when you can finally look at your life and look at all of your things and just take a breath and say, God, thank you for blessing me with all this stuff. Uh, continue to you know flood me with your favor and to show favor on me and family and everything that we're doing. But don't let me obsess about this. Let me just be a good steward instead of feeling like I own all this stuff. Because as soon as you just feel like you own all this stuff and it's yours and it's my, my mind, uh, that, I mean, that, that's where the people fall. I mean, that's, that's where you start sliding down a really slippery slope. And, uh, and that's where you can get really, really caught up in this whole ownership mentality. And, and honestly, it could drive you crazy and it could drive you further away from God, uh, which is what's happened, you know, with a lot of these, you know, billionaires who kind of think they're invincible and can do whatever they want. And, and that includes tearing up families and cheating on spouses and all that stuff. I mean, it, it, it it's so, so, so sad, uh, that, you know, those are a lot of the people who are in the limelight, right? Those are a lot of the people that, you know, many people idolize uh, when they should be looking towards God. So I hope this one was helpful. Um, I really love the book. If you're into reading books, it's a great one called Leadership Not by the Book. <clears throat> they, they really... Uh, they really struggle with that. The reason they called it that was because that was the big aha moment they got from <clears throat> from uh, from Harvard. You know, that, that, that's kind of what Harvard said, like nothing here is by the book. But the irony is if you take the knot away, it's leadership by the book. So that's kind of what's highlighted. The knot is the knot on the on the actual cover of the book is in a whole different color and different font. So, uh, you know, it's leadership by the book, <clears throat> by the Bible. So if you like books, definitely buy it. David Green, really, really uh, fascinating book. And uh, go shop in a Hobby Lobby. Uh, great, great people. Uh, I haven't been in one in a, in a while. Uh, and so I, I'm intrigued to go back into one and just see how it all matches up to what you know they talk about here in, uh, in this book. So guys, appreciate you. Love you. And uh, we will talk to you on the next episode. Cause vision, it's in my soul It was passed down to me from the days of old Find us on the water if there was a way It's been said my papa, he wrote the book On catching big reds and 20 pounds snook I wish I knew So